Hi, welcome to Goop Book Club. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Kiki. I'm the wellness director on our editorial team, and I am so excited to be talking to Caleb Azuma Nelson today, the author of Open Water, who I will bring on in just a minute. Um, for people who are new, welcome to Goop Book Club. Um, every month we pick one book to read together, and uh, we always have all the latest at goop.com slash goop book club. You can find reading guides, uh, Q&As with the authors. We have um, Zoom chats with just our members. And then, of course, at the end of the month, show up here live for a talk with the author. So we are live today. You can sit, submit questions um, right into the chat box in YouTube, and we will get to as many as we can throughout the conversation. Um, and if there are any tech glitches, we apologize in advance. So. I'm going to bring Caleb on in a second, but I just want to say how much I truly loved reading this book. And I went back and read it a second time. And I, every word, every passage is so stunning and so lyrical. It's like listening to music. Um, absolutely incredible. It is a love story about two best friends, um, two young Black artists who meet in a pub in London one night after, at a birthday party and how they um, fall in love and how their relationship develops. So Caleb, um, come on, and thank you so much for being here today. Hey, what's going on? Thank you for having me. Yes, of course. Um, and Caleb so kindly agreed to start by reading a passage from the book, one of my favorites, and he was very patient with me as I was like, wait, or this one, or this one, because I love so many. But um, Caleb, I'll turn it over to you. I'm perfect. All right, I'm going to read from, it's somewhere in the middle of the book where the uh, the kind of like intimacy and connection between these two friends is really beginning to, to heighten. Um, all right. And as the sun set, you whispered secrets and intimacies into the solitude of the now empty sky. She asked who you were. What a question, you said. It's not that I don't know. There are just bits and pieces that need filling in. You wonder what it means to know someone and whether it's possible to do so wholly. You don't think so. But perhaps in the not knowing comes the knowing, born of an instinctive trust that you both struggle to elucidate or rationalize. It just is. From, north, from south to north, main line, underground, emerging only to submerge. You enter a pub and they direct you down the stairs towards a bunker-like basement. What are you drinking, you say. We are drinking rum and coke. Single or double, the woman behind the bar asks. Double, she said. The bar woman gazes at us, two giggly fools at ease, and takes comfort in our joy. The measures she pours are healthy, spilling over the limit and she gives us a nod a smile a small acknowledgement you look around the basement and remember that being seen is no small joy i'm gonna go to the toilet before they start she says heading round the corner as she leaves there's a crackle of feedback from the speakers your friend theo takes the stage his band quickly joining he announces himself, and this is a different person from the young man you know. This is a person who is more certain. This is a person who is confident in his honesty. The songs are full of nostalgia, which is to say they are full of mourning. One remembers that which came before, often with a fond sadness, a want to return, despite knowing to return to a memory is to morph it, to warp it. Every time you remember something, the memory weakens as you're remembering the last recollection rather than the memory itself. Nothing can remain intact. Still, it does not stop you wanting, it does not stop you longing. She joins you halfway through the third song and has ditched the patterned kimono she was wearing, now stuffed in her bag. A band of black cotton covers her chest stomach and clean shoulders exposed. You hand her her drink and she leans back into you, the spread of brown skin pressed against your chest, 
meeting the sliver of flesh where you have unbuttoned your shirt one more than usual. One arm snakes around her, your fingers perched on her collarbone. She eases into you further and you're in a rhythm, hips linking slow, moving to memories of moments just past. You are here and you are not. You are on the balcony, you are on the hill, you are in sunshine, you are in darkness, you are in the open air, you are in the basement, you are in perpetual joy, you are eternally sad. Her short black curls tickle your chin as her head winds this way and that. You wonder how long this moment could stretch for and how much it could contain. You, her, this crowded basement of singles and couples and groups, the black woman at the bar who sees you both, who you see too, Theo and his band on stage, nostalgia, melancholy, joy, concrete floors, makeshift walls, applause, a night too warm, introduction, cigarette split, eyes narrow, nicotine, one more drink, one more drink, one more drink. And you're on the sofa in the pub, sticky leather on skin, nursing what will be your last. She sits beside you, cross-legged, your hand resting against the ridges of her spine. That's not a platonic hand on my back, she says. Am I bad, you say. No, it's okay. I like it. Thank you. I love that passage so much. And that last line makes me laugh about not the platonic hand. So funny. How how did these two characters come to you? Did you start with one? Did you start with a feeling? And how did you kind of how did their relationship develop in your in your mind for you? I think I I started first with like the the feeling, the spark of like seeing someone and having that very immediate connection and wondering how wondering how I could write a relationship that was not so much a matter of if but a matter of when um and convincing an audience and a reader that that was the case too that it, it wasn't like that there were the, there's the possibility that this might not happen it's like how long might it take for for it to happen um and I really I was really intrigued in this in this sort of like idea of their relationship, like ebbing and flowing like water, like coming towards each other and like having some distance. Cause I think so often, like when, when those moments occur, it's rare that like, there's just, okay, that's it. We're, we're done and we're good. Um, it takes a while for people to, to come together. And so I wanted them to sort of meander towards each other. And I think that I did get that sensation as a reader because it was interesting when I was going back and I read it the second time, I was thinking, you know, what are the, the tension points? What are the plot points? And it is that it's that building of when is something going to spill over? When is it going to be, be too much or enough? And you really do build that tension and that complication in, in the book. And I loved there were so many great kind of metaphors and symbolism throughout, but this idea of like, there was this line that connected them and where did the line stem from? Where was it going to go? And also these ideas of fractures and, and breaks and in someone's life interior in a relationship. And was that something that you kind of thought about initially or, or how did kind of that symbolism come into the book? I think I was, I was so, um, I was so conscious of this idea of, of people reaching towards each other. And for me, like it, it felt like drawing a line towards someone else. That was like an image that came to me very early on. Um, and thinking about how like the line that you do draw to people is never, it's never a straight line. It often kind of bends and it curves, but you're with all of your actions, you're kind of, you're going towards someone, you're trying to, you're trying to build a connection. Um, and I like, you know, I think that in all kinds of relationships, whether it's romantic or platonic or it's your family, there can be experiences which mean that that line sort of doesn't quite reach or it falls away, or there are there are moments where there are breaks in the line or there are fractures. Um, 
and then there are moments where you find yourself joining together and I wanted to write something that didn't that wasn't a kind of like a simplistic curve that was like okay two people meet and then they have a connection and then that's it like I wanted to to provide like a full and whole portrait of how they might come together and also how they might how their relationship might fall apart yeah and I thought I mean, there was the thrill just of them falling for each other. There was that one great line that I think it's either the practice Agnes brother or friend says, like, you look like you just got hit by a bus, man. And like, you're wondering, like, when's the next time you're going to get hit by that same bus? And I was like, that was so funny. You, you had all of these kind of like plays on these different, I think even the protagonist says at one point, like, he understands he starts to understand something about a love cliche because he's like i would have all of these cliches ha happen to me so there was that very sweet and tender part of their relationship and, and the other thing that i think was so interesting and i've talked about this with other authors on here before is how you handled trauma throughout the book and this idea that i think the protagonist was exploring was what are the sum what was the sum of his trauma is he more than the sum of his traumas and I thought it was really interesting and I don't know if this was intentional but the way you were very careful to show so many different aspects of him and that he obviously was more than his traumas but you also didn't minimize his traumas because at, towards the end of the book when there is this break in their relationship the way I read it is like he he had experienced so many traumas that had added up and had really affected him um so you you weren't i don't know i just thought you did a beautiful job of showing how he was struggling with that and how he was processing it and and how it really did affect him and affect his relationship ultimately mm -hmm. i think there's a um you know like i'm as well as a writer i'm a photographer as well and there's that element really makes its way into my work and that like i'm I'm always trying to afford, especially my, my black characters, like this kind of like fullness and wholeness to them. Because I know that like with an image, you only, you get a glimpse. And in that like specific moment that you're seeing, you're, you're, you kind of have to come to a decision or a conclusion about who these people are or, or what has like, what they've been affected by, what brings them joy, how they grieved, um, how they love. Um, and I think in this, with these two characters, like I was trying to do the same thing. I was trying to say like, this isn't, you know, this isn't a long book. Um, and in many ways it feels like a, like a fragment, like a snapshot of, of a moment in, in their lives. And I wanted to, to afford them that, that same thing. I wanted to say, you know, there are these real like traumatic moments and there are these real moments of loss and of grief. Um, but like life is fuller than that. There's also these moments of real like happiness and delight and real joy. Yeah, and I'm so glad you brought up the photographic element because that was something we talked about in our book club chat, just how there were so many things that felt like these snapshots. And I thought also this other idea that the character was exploring was, can you really, can you really know someone else? And what does it mean to feel seen, not just to be looked at, um and i love the the ending because it, it was like no matter what i felt like what she had given him was that she was gonna he was gonna be seen through her eyes and mm -hmm. i thought that was such an interesting play on this idea of gaze and how someone else sees you um mm -hmm. and was that something that you really thought about as a photographer or how did you kind of like play with that idea yeah i think so like prior to writing this book i i would have uh, i would be asked about my photographic practice in relation to my writing practice and i would have separated the two but as soon as i started writing this i was just like they're they're one and the same the this you know this way of seeing the world is something that governs my my whole artistic practice and actually just my life in general like i'm really thinking about the way the the way that we see each other in a way that we afford space to each other both with like kind of people we, that we know but also people that we like strangers people that we just meet um and i think with this i was really i was also wondering about you know this idea of like affording someone that you love like a like a space where they can wholly be 
themselves where they feel like they can be seen and this afford themselves like a sense of freedom in that respect um and i think you know if you're able to see someone in the way that they want to be seen or you're able to give someone the space to to show you this is how i want to be seen there's there's a freedom in that right there's a there's like a kind of like an honesty that takes place and an exchange of honesty that takes place when you're able to say hey like you can be yourself here you can be you can be whole um and i think that's something i really try and do with my photography like i most of my work is is portraits um and it's like it's very much like just providing space for people to bring themselves and to be be free um and i think that to me is like really what love is or what love can be like space to be your most honest self yeah and it's also you did such a beautiful job of playing this with this uh this tension between suppression and freedom in each of the characters and how in some ways you know love was the ultimate act of of expressing themselves and so i think that that did really come out how did you think about the the construct in the format like did you always know initially it was going to be him coming to her with this honest tale or you know what he felt like was an honest tale of what happened and how did you was it always going to be in the second person one thing that i loved about it was it felt like it, in a way it was this stream of conscious like again like an act of freedom i think somewhere in the book the protagonist says like when he's anxious at night he likes to listen to rap because he feels like what what an expression of freedom to hear a black man saying what he feels on the spot and that's what this book felt like to me like it felt like it was a release like it was a you know, a journal and an outpouring. So I was just curious about how that that format came to you. It's funny because um, when before like writing Open Water, I'd been writing a lot of nonfiction. Um, I'd been writing a lot of essays that kind of dealt with the same topics and they were explored in Open Water. So looking at love and freedom and blackness and, and also looking at uh, different forms of art as a means of expressing emotions and and feeling um but i think when when i kind of like set out to write open water in its form today like i i was like very intentional with with certain things so like i wanted it to i wanted it to have that that sense of freedom on that page that sense of almost like stream of consciousness almost like like a freestyle in a way that like a like someone might come a rapper might get into a booth and just like be like very honest with like the the things that are really on their heart and they're at the forefront of their mind um, but I also wanted to create something really intimate um, and having, employing a second person meant that, you know, my audience could be both a, both a reader and also the protagonists themselves. It brings you so much closer to the action than the first or the third person could, at least in this instance, for me. Um, and that intimacy, like, really kind of heightened that, the effect of honesty because um as a reader you're like you're you're asking yourself the questions when there are questions posed within the, within the text like when if you read aloud how are you feeling that's like you know that's something that you might be asking yourself and it's the same thing with not having neither of the characters have names and so for me this could be this this could be you as a reader um my like primary aim was really to just make sure that the the reader felt like as immersed in in the work as possible and i think like you know using a second person and also having all of these different references to music or to photography or to, to film or to art kind of just sort to create this universe in which a reader could like could house themselves in for the brief moments when they are when they are reading the book no and i felt all of that and it's it's tricky because i think to the second person when it doesn't work it alienates you more as a reader because if you don't identify if you don't connect then it can be so jarring so when i first started reading the book i was like oh how is this i know it's not a long book but i was like oh how am i going to feel throughout this but i, I felt mm -hmm. so close and i think too we were talking about this in our zoom the other day there is a, a strange intimacy when you don't use names because so often when you're you know when you're with your intimate partner or like a close friend it's like when you say someone's name it, it's almost like can be like a break in the conversation but you really did create this world well where it felt like the reader was a part of it and so privy to these 
these intimate thoughts and feelings. Um, and I loved all of the pop culture references. Like, I mean, the Alan Iverson one, I thought that was just so <laughs> funny. Like there were just, felt like you had all these gems throughout I'm that were. That. Like, not many, like, they're like, it's a really specific sort of reference, I think. Um, it was like, so not, funny and so think, spot yeah. on. <laughs> I definitely screenshotted that and like sent that to people. Cause I think that's one of the funniest, like, interviews and pop culture ever. Um, sure. But I'm sure there were others that went over my head, but that was something that I enjoyed about going back and reading it. Um, and I know you created a playlist from the book, which is so great because I had a lot of readers being like, oh my God, I want to listen to all these songs now. <laughs> um, and it's so good. I feel like at least like two times cooler now that I've, I've been listening to the playlist for a while. Um, but another question that came up in our Zoom was how you thought about creating the rhythm of, of your writing. And was that, is that something that you, that really comes from music for you or? That was like a, there was a real intentionality to that. There's a, there's an African-American artist, uh, Arthur Jaffer, who um, I saw speak at the Serpentine Gallery in London, like maybe like four or so years ago. Um, and he was like, he was super cool. Like we, like we got into the talk and he'd set up like these big speakers and the room was playing Jay-Z and Frank Ocean. And um, he's like, he's a really brilliant visual. He was a cinematographer and, and became a visual artist. And he said something which like I've never forgotten. He was talking about, he was talking about black music being one of the only spaces that but black people didn't have to be marginal. And in my head, I was like, oh, you know, like I'm I'm not a musician, um, but I feel like there's a sense of rhythm that I'm always drawn to. And so I wondered how I could take that idea and and sort of play with it in in literature to afford both myself as a writer and also the narrative itself a, a greater sense of of freedom. Um, and I think, you know, as I've been as I've been writing and rewriting and kind of doing like the the press run for for this book, like I've been thinking a lot about rhythm and the sort of inherent rhythms that I think we all have and that we all possess and that often like we just kind of need to tap into to to understand and then express. This is a nerdy question, but I'm also curious, like do you carry a notebook around or a, for, like a camera? Because I felt like so many of the, the metaphors that you used were things that felt so visual to me. Like in the prologue, mm -hmm. I love, this the two of you like headphone wires tangling caught up in this something a happy accident a messy miracle you lost your gaze for a moment and your breath quickened as when a drop call across the distance gains unexpected gravity like i just felt you had so many of these little gems that i was like i was picturing you like oh if, like a call drops you're like writing it down in your notebook and like gonna come back to it but where where do you kind of like draw from you you took all of these kind of everyday moments or objects and really built so built such a world around them. I think there's like like I I feel like I'm always writing even when I don't have I try to carry a notebook everywhere I go or like just kind of like tap things into my my notes on my phone. Um, but like I feel like a lot of the time I'm just kind of. I'm like just really astounded by everyday moments. And so they like, they stay, they remain. Um, yesterday I was on the, I was on the underground, I was on the tube and I I saw a guy reading, reading a book and he was like literally like nose to, nose to the page. And I was so intrigued by what he was reading. I, I actually didn't get a chance to, to catch it. Like I kept trying to shift to see whether I could, I could see what it was. Um, but I looked over his shoulder and I saw that his bookmark was a 200 Naira note. So it's like a, it's a, it's Nigerian currency. Um, and I thought there was something really interesting about him using a, a currency that wasn't of this country to, to bookmark something that he was so immersed in. And in a way it was almost like a souvenir, it was a reminder of a, of a place that he might call home. Um, and that for me, like, you know, those like tiny everyday moments are just so fascinating for me. Like I'm always, I think it's the photography in me, but I'm always just kind of like wide eyed and looking around and like feeling very like just astounded by the world in general. I feel like that's like the beginning of a novel right there. I, I would read a story about that guy. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I am also a really big fan of short novels. And I don't say that as like being lazy, but I think there, <laughs> there's something, be I feel like there's something between a novella and like mm -hmm. a 360 page novel. And there's something so special about being pulled in and immersed in a book that you can truly read in one sitting. Mm -hmm. Was that something like, is that something that you read? Was that something you set out to do? Or as a writer, do you just write something as long as it needs to be? And once it hits, once it's complete, it's complete. I'm always, I'm always aiming for brevity. Um, I'm very much like, I've been a big fan of shorter novels, like growing up and, and have always been aiming towards that just because I think there's something like, but there is something really special about experiencing, experiencing a novel in one sitting or kind of like in what feels like one burst. Um, and I think writers who manage to capture that, it's almost, I've described it before as almost like photographing lightning. Like it's like, there's like a very specific moment that you're that you're capturing. And it's almost like a, it's an atmosphere. It, it's a vibe that carries. Um, and I'm always astounded when people manage to do it over like 150, uh, 200 pages. Like, I think that's just like, that's really, really special and very measured. Um, my intention for Open Water was to have something that you could read in one sitting. Um, and so it, that it could feel almost like a piece of music, like an album that you're that you're sitting down to listen to, but also something that you could return to and read slowly or kind of like read like different parts um, out of sequence that mattered the most to you. Like I wanted it to to have this this element of, of being able to do both of those things. The other question, and I'm sorry, I'm sure you've gotten this a lot, but that our book club members were curious to know about is how much of you is in the protagonist mm -hmm. and was the the woman character modeled after anyone in your life? I know you said it kind of started with a feeling. Yeah, I think it's more so like, like it's not the like events aren't autobiographical, but the feelings is like they're very personal. It's like kind of that's what I was mapping the the book from. Like it's kind of like oh I like I know these feelings. Like I don't necessarily know these exact like moments or these exact events, but these feelings are things that I've been trying to express for for so long. Um, and it felt like right to use like kind of this as a, as a vehicle to express those feelings. Um, and maybe this is a good segue into this is a hard question, but I feel like you'll you'll handle it better than I would from a reader that put in. Um, if you could describe a recurring theme in your life, what would it be? Ooh. Um, it's probably I mean, it's probably freedom. Like it's this idea of like if if freedom and perhaps like finding it in finding it in love or finding it in honesty. Like I think that like freedom really informs my my um like definitely my photographic practice and more recently my my writing practice it's like trying to trying to create space where like i can either house my own freedom or house the freedom of those that i see around me or like my imagined characters um so yeah i, I would say freedom yeah, can you talk a little bit about, and in the written Q&A you did, you talked about a project that you were doing where you were photographing Black people. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and where that's at right now? Yeah, for sure. Like I am, um, I've been I've been doing this project for like the past like four or so years um, in which I will, I've, I've actually recently moved into an, an artist studio. So like I have space to photograph people now. But generally, like I would ask um, my friends and family and people that people around me and actually just like reach out to people that like I admire and respect and ask if I can if I can make images of them in in a space where they're comfortable, which could be their homes or a park or like a public place that they frequent. Um, and I think it that for me is is all about like creating space. It's about like asking asking someone opposite me to 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 bring themselves as honestly as possible and i think there's freedom in that and being able to say hey like you can come here and you don't have to hide like you can be your your whole self um yeah and i, I don't really know where, where or how that project kind of ties itself 
up, I imagine eventually like I will, I will have like this huge selection of, of images that I can display or collate and 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 put like a, a book or something together. Um, but it's a very, it's like a very, um, it's a practice which like feels very like very like fundamental. It feels very practical. It feels like I'm I'm like really doing something like active um, to to create that space and to to like afford other people freedom around me. That's beautiful. And this is probably another annoying question, but what are what are you writing, or what do you think you'll write next if you know? I'm yeah. I there there will be another another novel um, sooner rather than later. Um, very, it will be very similar to Open Water. It's about two young people, um, one who is a chef and one who is a, a jazz musician. Um, and I'm like, you know, really, again, like very intrigued in, in music, but I've been very, um, I've been thinking a lot about community and gathering and how, like for me growing up, food was so central to that. Um, how like so much of my like, my community spaces like in inhabit this, this process of like sitting down opposite each other at a table or like standing and sharing sharing a meal and like sharing stories and so that's like that's my next kind of like literary project um but I'm also working on some some film and tv projects and as well which I'm really excited by that's fun I'm already prepared for your next novel to make me so hungry because I felt like <laughs> even with this one it's not like they were out at bars all the time but maybe it's just from covid but i had like such a longing to like go to like a pub or something in london just all of your descriptions so i feel like i'll be very hungry reading this next one that's really exciting um before i let you go anything that that you're reading lately or any other books that you've you've been loving um i read memorial by brian washington um like at the tail end of last year, and I've been telling everyone that I had about it. I'm just like, I think it's so, so brilliant. I think he's like, I think he's a really special writer um, and captures these very quiet moments of our lives that are like, yeah, they're very, um, it's really hard to like capture the mundane and the everyday. And that's something that I'm always trying to reach towards. And I think, I think Brian does it so well. Um, and Aftershocks by Nadia Wusu. Uh, I don't know if you've read, that one but also like brilliant <laughs> i have aftershocks in my stack i'm and i'm glad you said that now i'm going to move it up and i i love brian i loved lot so much and memorial i <laughs> just really really love talk about a book that also makes you hungry because there's so much great food <laughs> and cultural references in that book um but i agree i think he's actually i feel like he might have been the author i was talking to about um affording how he handles trauma and showing his different facets of his characters and i think he does that mm -hmm. so beautifully um so i'm glad and why do you mention those two um but thank you so much for being here today everyone open water if you haven't read it yet please 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 do and caleb i really appreciate everything you've done for us this month and, and being here today it was so lovely to talk to you thank you for having me thank you yeah, I'll talk to you soon. All right, take care. And then everyone else can stay on and I'm going to announce our June pick. So a lot of the books we've been reading for Goop Book Club have been new releases, um, but this one is a book that came out a couple of years ago. It is one of my all time favorites and I've just been waiting to have a free month where we could read it together. When I first started thinking about starting Goop Book Club, this was the book that I had in mind that I thought it would be so fun to read together. So without further ado, it is The Ensemble by Asia Gibel. Um, it is a brilliant book about four friends, um, four, if they start when they're four young friends um, who are part of a string quartet, and it follows them over the course of their lives as they try to sort out the comp their complicated relationships to each other um, and to music. It, the world of competitive music in this is so dramatic and so brilliantly done. While you're reading, you're trying to figure out if two of the characters are going to ever get together romantically, um, if one is going to lead the group. There's so many great kind of tension points and turns in the stories. And I just think it's also a really brilliant depiction of friendship. So 
I hope you all read it with us. It's called The Ensemble. Um, and you can go to goop.com slash goop book club for the latest. Um, at the beginning of June, we'll update. Members so you can join our Facebook group to keep up with the latest there. And then I'll be back on at the end of June for another live chat with Asia. So the ensemble, thank you all for joining and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye.